proposed to be enclosed? Uh, what are you going to carry okay. on with that? Uh, we have uh, canceled the implosion uh, party set for this Saturday, and we will uh, look at where we go from here. Well, the flights that were diverted, where did they go? Well, they, they could have gone a variety of places. We don't have all that specific information. Uh, it typically, when a plane is diverted, it's diverted to the Category X airport, the largest airport that is closest to where they're going, but we don't have specific information. The planes on the ground right now uh, that are sitting there on the runway. Any indication that perhaps a uh, terrorist would be one of those planes? have no idea whatsoever. And when you say shutting down the air site, can you just articulate that a little more? Certainly. Is this the, go, just tell it's us certainly what you mean by that. Right. Uh, what that means is, is uh, any when you go through your security checkpoint for those customers who are used to going to the airport, anything on the opposite side of that is called that secure side of the airport. And those are the areas uh, that are being closed to the public. Um, they are still keeping open those areas in front of that. They call that the ATO area, or, or where you can check your bags, that sort of thing, to accommodate any customers' questions and things that might find their way to the airport. So all folks who are stranded are being moved out, essentially? Indeed, and being accommodated, uh, those uh, based upon what the plans are by their respective air carriers, uh, be accommodated in local hotels and things of that nature. That's all. The, uh, sorry, one more question, and we're going to have to we'll get back to our business. I thought it was bad when we were down at the terminal. They said that uh, people who were coming off the plane or having their bags searched or what, their luggage searched, that it comes out of scare That's possible. That is possible on the part of the air carrier. Okay, thank you. We'll be back to you. I think the most important thing to take away is that there is no specific threat to this airport, and rest assured that our DPS folks uh, we'll keep you alerted if anything else uh, is to occur. Thank Kevin, you. what time should we expect another break? Well, there you hear the comments from two officials. I have to be perfectly honest, not sure who they are, whether they work for American Airlines or they work for the airport in Dallas, but they were in, in, in Dallas today, and they say at the end of that news conference there is no specific threat to that airport, uh, which will be a reassuring to people who are around the airport, but anybody who's wanting to fly anywhere in the country at the moment is unable to do so anyway. But the conditions in the country are of such a confusing nature at the moment that stuff just comes in all the time. We've had authorities in Lexington. I'm Del Walters inside the ABC7 News Studios, joined with Carol Costello. We want to update you on the events that are occurring here locally. There are two major things we must deal with at this time. We know now, and we have been reporting throughout the morning, that one of the planes involved was Flight 77, that was a Boeing 757, operating out of Dulles Airport to Los Angeles. 58 passengers on board were trying to get information regarding that. Also, well, we there is a, a situation number. on we, the We Pentagon. should mention the number yes. right now. If you believe you have loved ones on board that American Airlines flight, that is number 77. American Airlines has provided us a number. It is 1-800-245-0999. Another note. American Airlines has shut down its operations. Do not go to the airport. Do not try to call the airline. They will not answer you. We want to now bring you up to date on the situation at the Pentagon. If we could take that shot that we just saw a second ago. There is still smoke pouring from within inside the Pentagon. We know that the plane, the plane that crashed into the Pentagon, penetrated the outer wall and crashed into the inner wall. We have received so far reports from one hospital, the Virginia Hospital Center, that as many as 22 people have been bought there. No other reports of injuries or casualties at this point. Although we do hear from ABC News that there is extensive damage at the Pentagon, we also understand that the highest ranking officials were not on that side of the building, but there were high ranking officials located where that plane went through the building. Again, we do believe there have been deaths we just don't know yet, and of course we'll keep you posted on that. ABC 7 News reporter Sam Ford is standing by live at Gravelly Point. Sam, can you bring us up to date as to what the situation is there? I understand a plane actually just landed at National. Yes, Dell. Uh, well, as you can say, over two hours now, we've been looking at this plume of smoke from uh, across those trees. That is the area of the Pentagon. And as you said, there was a plane that landed here. The National Airport has been shut down. One plane came down, a small plane there. It looks like some sort of a, a Learjet. And it was escorted by a fighter jet, I guess, to make sure that it wasn't shot down. The speculation is that it is some VIP who had reason to be here and therefore the plane was brought in, although the airport itself is, is shut down. And we'll just give you a live picture there of the National Airport. If you can just, that is the take picture, and that is the live picture. That is the live picture of National Airport. All the planes there at National are shut down at this point.
And we've been here sort of watching refugees, you might say, who have been moving along the George Washington Parkway past the airport because so many of the roadways are closed down. Here are some of the people we talked to today. Tell us what happened. Um, my friend sent me an email saying that what's up with their airlines. We were like, what are you talking about? And all I know, I heard a big old boom, like the ground was shaking, and then he hasn't sent anything else. And one of my friends went down to the concourse. So I think, like, she's hurt. Did you all hear the, the noise and then? Yes, sir. I did. I'd... Immediately they evacuated us. Uh, we left the Pentagon. We passed most of the kids in the nursery, and they, they were fine. They were keeping them together. Um, we got on this path and we were trying to walk down to Old Town, but they just closed the path by National Airport. So, so they told us to wait here for about 30 minutes. And of course, those are people there who are evacuating, walking away from the Pentagon. Uh, what the colonel that we spoke to said that he walked two and a half miles. They're being blocked. People can't get from here to there, so they're just having to walk around trying to find a way out of this place because of all the... Uh, the road blockages because of the emergency situation over here on this side of the river. And of course, uh, it's a situation where Metro is still running, but uh, airports are closed, all airports around the country. And also there has been a considerable rush hour as much of the government has shut down and people have left the city. Sam, we have breaking news though. We want to interrupt you for just a minute. The National Guard, Troop 372 out of the district Please report to duty. Your services are sorely needed. We also have information about a United flight that has been missing. We understand it has now crashed. We do not know there. We do not know where, rather. United has just confirmed that for us, though. And we understand that, obviously, thousands of you in the area are waiting for your loved ones to come home. We want to bring you up to date on what's going on with the transportation situation. First of all, all train service in and out of Union Station has been suspended until further notice. Also, we are receiving reports that people are making their way out of the district. And at this point, it's safe to say that all of the roads leading out were in, in one of those situations where it's sort of like the rush hour during one of the winter snows, where all of the lanes are being directed out of the city. Sometimes at some intersections, police are ordering the traffic to continue on, yeah, but at other intersections, it. we are telling you to remain calm because that is about the only way that everyone will get to and from. We want to check in right now with ABC 7 News' Nancy Weiner with more on the transportation situation. Nancy? Good morning, Dell. Well, we have been here at the corner of Independence Avenue at the Ellipse for many hours now, and for most of the time, the traffic has looked like this, basically at a standstill in both directions. Right now, you do see a little bit of traffic moving in the westbound direction, but traffic been very, very heavy for hours. I want to take you on a little tour of our location. The Ellipse has been closed for about the past hour and a half. When Secret Service showed up, we saw a number of officers showed up. They donned flak jackets, and they told everyone who was standing on the ellipse to get off of it. Oh, past us, you can see the White House, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it from our cameras, but there has been a vastly noted increase in security on the White House grounds, both on the South Lawn and on the roof of the White House. Now, when this all first happened, hundreds of people began gathering on the ellipse, both tourists and people who had been evacuated from their buildings. They were coming up to ask us, asking us if we knew what was going on. And at times, dozens of people were actually gathered around our monitors. As you can imagine, a lot of tourists here on the mall, a number of people we spoke to who are from New York City, who wanted to know what was going on with their loved ones there. Now, as far as traffic is concerned, we do have some information to tell you about if you are trying to get out of town. Right now, the 14th Street Bridge is closed, and afternoon traffic batters have... All... All inbound bridges are closed and outbound are open. That is the latest information that we are getting right now. Of course, there is a, a quite a number of, quite a lot of people trying to get out of the district right now. What we can also tell you is that there is an afternoon traffic pattern in effect on the Rock Creek Parkway, which means that all lanes are going northbound. D.C. police right now are suggesting that people who want to get out of town take the southeast-southwest freeway. Canal Road also one way outbound right now. And as I said, the inbound lanes on bridges are closed, outbound is open, and as you mentioned, Union Station is closed as well. And of course, 395 near the Pentagon closed also. 
That's the latest from here reporting live from the Ellipse. I'm Nancy Weiner, ABC 7 News. Nancy, we also want to uh, thank you very much, but we also want to remind our audience that there is something you can do. We have received word from several area hospitals now and indeed the Red Cross that they are concerned now about blood shortages. So if you want to do something, if you feel like you're helpless at home and you want to know what can I do besides watch television, you can go out and you can donate blood at this point because obviously based on the simple numbers alone, there are 20,000 people who work in inside the Pentagon, casualties could be, and, and I emphasize once again at this point, could be large. And another uh, breaking news event to tell you about. All federal offices are now closed. Federal courthouses, rather, are closed and offices in Virginia, in Delaware, in Maryland, in Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Also, a word from D.C. police. Do not call 911 in the city. Do not call 911. They are overloaded. The number to call right now, 311. Number of schools also closed down in our area. Let's go to Greta Cruz in our newsroom now. Okay, thank you very much, Carol and Dell. Uh, before we get to the schools, I just want to mention something Nancy Weiner was talking about transportation. As far as Metro goes, we are told the Metro, the subways are running. However, the following stations are closed. Pentagon Station, Union Station, and the National Airport stations are closed. Uh, the trains are running through, but they're not stopping. Also, the yellow line from Huntington is switching routes to run through Arlington Cemetery out to the stadium armory. As for the bus ser service on Metro, we are told it is running, but of course traffic is clogged as people try to get out of the city, so there are delays and it is a mess. Let's get on to the schools now. These keep changing. We do have them that we can run down for you. Uh, here we go. Par uh, Arlington County Public Schools are open. However, if parents want to pick their kids up early, they may go to the school and do so. Prince George's County Public Schools will be closing two hours early today. D.C. Public Schools are open. However, the officials have asked parents to please try and go pick up your children as soon as possible. Montgomery County Schools closing one and a half hours early. Edison Friendship Public Charter School closing at 1230. Charles County Public Schools are open. Closing normal times, Loudoun County the same, and Alexandria schools also open as well. As moving on now to university closings, American University is closed. The University of Maryland College Park is open. However, the University College campus is closed. George Washington University is closed. Catholic University is closed. UDC is closed. Georgetown Law School, we are told, is now closed. And that is it as far as we have. These things will be changing throughout the day. A number of the schools I should mention, even though they are still open, the public schools, they have canceled evening and afternoon activities. So you will want to check with that. Yeah, and I can Thank imagine you, many parents want their kids out of schools, but absolutely calm is the word of the day right now. Right. Thank you, Greta. And we want to also bring you up to date and to give you that number again from American Airlines. Undoubtedly, many of you are at home, you're watching and you're wondering about the loved ones who may have been on one of those flights. This is the information number that American Airlines has given out. It is 1-800-245-0999. We know of four planes that appear to have been involved at this point in this terrorist attack. One was an American Airlines Flight 11, a Boeing 6 767 from Boston to L.A. The flight had 81 passengers on board, nine flight attendants, and two pilots. Also involved was Flight 77, that is a Boeing 757, that operated here out of Washington Dulles to Los Angeles with 58 passengers on board, four flight attendants, and two pilots. That's 156 people on board those two planes. Yeah, the others involved are United Flights, United, uh, United Flight 43 going from Newark to San Francisco, also United Flight 175. Boston to L.A., we believe that uh, that has now crashed, but we do not know where. And, of course, there's a fifth plane involved that crashed into the Pentagon, a smaller plane. We have ABC 7 News crews out throughout the region. We are efforting information on the situation at local hospitals. We are efforting the information that is unfolding at the Pentagon and also with regards to the national security of Washington, D.C. itself. As that information becomes available, we will re-interrupt ABC News. But right now, back to ABC News and Peter Jennings. Engaged in a war now with the, with the Israeli government uh, has also... Uh, reacted very quickly to this today to express. Uh, I, perfectly honest, I haven't heard what he said, but so let's hear what he said now. This is Palestinian President Yasser Arafat. First of all, I am offering my con condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the uh, to the American President, uh, President Bush, 
to his government, to the American people for this terrible act. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Unbelievable. Now, that's the Palestinian president, chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, Yasser Arafat, who, as I think everybody who watches the news or reads the news these days understands, is in a, 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 a very, very bitter war with the Israelis, um, and in, in which uh, terrorism uh, has been a factor. Palestinians see what the Israelis do to them as terrorism. Certainly the Israelis and much of the world see the Palestinian and other suicide bombers who've attacked inside Israel uh, to be terrorism of the most gruesome order. No question about that. And so we should not be surprised, as on previous circumstances, to see Chairman Arafat um, expressing his condolences. But other Palestinians who believe the United States is responsible for what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, or at least complicit, and is certainly supplying the Israelis' arms, will be happy to see this attack on the United States today. So take a look at a scene from Jerusalem not too long ago, in which there is some celebration that the powerful United States has been harmed, has been seen to be vulnerable, has been hurt, I suppose, in the broadest sense of the world and and the people who go off to do this sort of thing both in the Middle East now you must remember that a vast majority of the uh, vast majority of the population of the Middle East now in in all countries is under 21 much of it under 15 certainly under 17 and and the kind of tensity and intention if one presumes this this terrorism one showed that this terrorism has come had its genesis or had its roots somewhere in the Middle East um, or at least in people who are opposed, uh, have, uh, have uh, are just filled, brimming, brimming with anger at the United States. And we are now becoming more experienced with the notion that there are young men, for the most part, uh, who are prepared to uh, blow themselves up along with everybody else in terms if they can be, if they can be a service to the cause. And, it, 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 and, and they believe, and they believe, as do some people believe about Islam, that they will, by sacrificing themselves, go on to another place. It's an unfair comment on Islam uh, in, some, in, in some respects, but it is certainly a motivating factor that the hatred of the United States and the hatred of the United States is a patron of Israel. Whether you're, from, whether you're from Afghanistan or whether you're from Iran, Iraq, or inside the Palestinian territories, is so intense at some levels and has become more intense in recent months that nobody will be, a great many people will not be surprised at this attack today, though, like everybody else, will be amazed at the magnitude and success of it. John McCrethy at the Pentagon. John. Peter, we are standing outside the Pentagon at this point. It has been already a long morning for rescue workers and police here. Uh, one eyewitness I talked to who was on this busy highway outside the Pentagon this morning said he saw an airplane coming directly over his head. It was an American Airlines plane. He could see the number on the plane. He could almost see the passengers inside. As it went along the highway, started clipping off the uh, high wires and the different light poles along the highway and slammed directly into the side of the Pentagon. As we said earlier, Peter, the aircraft penetrated deep inside the Pentagon. It is uh, organized in rings from the E ring on the outside. It penetrated all the way into the A ring in the inner part of the Pentagon. Uh, after it burned for a number of minutes, a part of the building collapsed. By the time rescue workers could get in there, the destruction was just terrific. So John, do you have any sense of the casualties? Uh, we don't have any sense, Peter, except the size of the medical operation that has been set up here is enormous. Uh, they are anticipating the casualties. Certainly the injured will be in the hundreds. Uh, I certainly don't want to speculate on those killed. And, John, it, it, it's a little hard to get, to, to get a sense of the size sometimes for the picture. Can you describe maybe in feet or in yards how big a, how big a penetration this is? The roof has collapsed, Peter. There is a chasm in the side of the Pentagon that is probably 200 or 300 feet across. Um, from the roof of the Pentagon, there is this huge V shape that has collapsed. You can see deep inside the Pentagon from the street now. This is into the inner courtyard of the Pentagon itself. 
It's into the innermost ring of the Pentagon, Peter. Uh, I have not been able to get into the courtyard, but I was told that the penetration was all the way into the deepest ring of the Pentagon. And John, it, it, the office building, the Pentagon is about, what, six stories high? It's uh, five stories mm. above ground, Peter, and several stories below. Uh, clearly, the damage uh, is primarily above ground, but also some of those in the lower offices. I was sitting in the Pentagon when the uh, attack happened. I was on the opposite side of the building. It shook the entire building. It was very clear that something terrible had happened. Uh, there was chaos immediately after the attack, Peter. Secretary of Defense, I walked out with the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, the Marine Corps Commandant couldn't get out the door because security had locked it. Uh, it was chaos. Okay, John, thank and the fires are still, are still burning at the moment, we believe? They are still burning. They are mostly oil fires, it appears, Peter. Uh, the fire hoses have been on the, uh, the various fires for the last several hours, so they're beginning to put them out. But obviously, there is still heavy gray smoke coming out of that portion of the Pentagon that was so terribly damaged. John, there are a couple of aircraft, at least, around the country today which are still unaccounted for. You gave a very clear description earlier of how this aircraft had approached the Pentagon. But did anybody able to identify it as an aircraft associated with an airline? Absolutely, Peter. The eyewitness I talked to looked up and said it was an American Airlines plane. I saw it clear as could be. It went right over the top of my car and clipped a pole right in front of where my car was. Thank you very much, John McCarthy. I actually think that you may have said that earlier, and I simply, I, I simply lost it in terms uh, just lost it. And so we now know that it was from at least one eyewitness there. It was an American Airlines aircraft which which, uh, which crashed into the Pentagon. So we, let me just bring you, try to get some grasp on the airplane. We have two United flights, a 757, which was on its way from New York to San Francisco, which crashed um, near Pittsburgh. We have a United flight which crashed from Boston to Los Angeles, United 175, and we do not know where that aircraft has crashed or been crashed as of now. And we have these two American flights, uh, one from Boston to Los Angeles, um, which is a 767 with 81 passengers and 11 crew on board, talking about almost 100 people on American Flight 11. And American Flight 77, which was, which was scheduled from Washington to Los Angeles, uh, with 58 passengers and six crew members on board. And John Miller and I have been sitting here looking at each other about where these flights were going. And there's several ways to speculate about it, but you came up with one very interesting on from a, from a forensic standpoint, if you, if you look operationally uh, to, to crash these flights, it would have been just as simple to get on the, the Washington shuttle or the New York shuttle and crash one into the Trade Center and the other in the Pentagon. The choice of flights here, Newark to San Francisco, Boston to L.A., Dulles to L.A. Uh, Excuse me, John, I apologize. Let me get to come back just because we have the New York governor here. Sure. Governor George Pataki, the governor of New York, I believe, is on the telephone or somewhere. Governor Pataki, do you hear me? Yes, Peter, I hear you fine. Well, why don't you first start off, sir, and give us your appraisal of the day so well, far. Well, it's just, uh, it's just a horrific scene, and uh, everybody's pulling together. We're activating the state emergency forces, but uh, our hearts and prayers are with uh, the victims and the families of those victims and we have to at this point just focus on trying to help as many people whose lives are at risk as possible and dealing with those who have been injured. Do you have some sense of the magnitude of casualties? Uh, we don't want to quantify a number, but obviously it's a horrific incident that, uh, uh, that really is, is just an, a, an incredible outrage against the people of New York and the people of America. Uh, but uh, at this point, our focus is on trying to make sure that those whose lives are still at risk are as protected and those who have been injured are treated as quickly and as well as possible. Governor, do you believe that thousands of people have been killed? Uh, I don't want to use a number, Peter. At this point, the goal is, uh, is simply to try to help as many people as possible. We're working closely with the city, with our National Guard forces coming in to help relieve the, the city police and fire. Uh, obviously, it's a situation that uh, just cries out for uh, people to, to be horrified. And uh, But what we have to do at this point is focus on uh, helping those who are at risk, helping those who have been injured, making sure there's an orderly removal from lower Manhattan. And, and that is our focus at this point. Governor, have you, have you, are you in a position to go to the scene? Are you in a position to go to lower Manhattan? Do you think you should? Would you like to? Uh, or are you, are you locked down? 
No, I'm, a, I'm in the city, uh, but the important thing is to be able to stay in contact with the White House, with City Hall, with our statewide emergency services. We've gotten uh, offers of support from all the surrounding states with their emergency services, and the critical thing right now is to be able to coordinate to make sure that the response is the strongest and the, the most compassionate it can be for the people whose lives are still at risk. And we're mobilizing National Guard units from across the state. We're getting help from the surrounding states and coordinating with the city, and that's what, we're do that's what we have to do at this point. And Governor, what have you done? about the other so-called high-profile target potential targets in New York City like the UN and the bridges and things like uh, this are they all locked are they all evacuated uh, and locked UN, down now? UN's evacuated the tunnels have been closed the the, the uh, George Washington Bridge is open under security for emergency services coming in and uh, people going out we've shut down most of the mass transit Grand Central is open under very tight security but people who pass through the security are uh, have limited service to the to the northern suburbs and we're doing the same thing on Long Island, but uh, the important thing now is to provide as much help as quickly and as effectively to those whose lives are at risk or those who've been injured, and we're working with the city and the federal officials to make sure that happens. Do you believe that New York City is now under control? New York City has been under attack, uh, and until we get through this, uh, we just have to continue to respond as, as strongly as we can. And are you in a in a in a profile now? Are you in a position where you actually think there's there's a potential for more? Uh, we just don't know. That's why we have to not only help those who have been injured, but also take every security step we can to try to prevent further incidents. We just don't know, Peter. Okay. Governor Pataki, thank you very much. Governor George Pataki of New York, who is in New York City, um, which, of course, is where he probably belongs at a, at a moment like this. Downtown Manhattan is saying simply that the National Guard has been called in, the tunnels are closed, the George Washington Bridge, which is across... Uh, which goes across the Hudson River um, from uh, from the west side of Manhattan into New Jersey. Just remember, a large segment of the, or large, many thousands of people from New Jersey work in New York, and there's tremendous commerce back and forth on a daily basis. That has all been brought to a help. It's interesting to recall, John Miller, that the attack on the Trade Towers in '93 was launched from New Jersey, or at least the operational headquarters of the people who attacked the Trade Center were in New Jersey. Correct, uh, and the uh, the building of the bomb, and uh, the original conspiracy was all carried out in towns right across the river. In mm -hmm. fact, the conspirators uh, later admitted that they watched from New Jersey to see if the buildings would in fact fall, and they didn't. They this did. time they did. They did today. And Governor Pataki, trying as politicians again must on occasions like this, trying to express uh, the horror and the commitment that the political establishment feels to those people who have died and those people who need to be rescued. You know, it's an answer to every question about whether or not something was locked down or something. He came back every time that their priority now is to try to help those people who are in deep and in some cases still desperate trouble. Uh, George Stephanopoulos, um, one of our senior reporters, is downtown. Hey, George, where have you been? What have you seen? What do you think? Well, Peter, I'm going to give you kind of a pool report from several of our correspondents down here of basically what happened down here in downtown New York between 9.45 and 10.45 when the two explosions and the collapse of the World Trade Center happened. Uh, at the time, I was actually in the subway heading towards the World Trade Center right around Franklin Street, and after the first explosion, the subway station started to fill with smoke. The subway cars started to fill with smoke, and the subways actually stopped. Uh, they then diverted us around the World Trade Center to Park Place, which is one, one stop beyond the World Trade Center. We, we got to that train station at around 10.35, Peter, and it was a scene mm. like I've ever seen before in my entire life. As we tried to get out of the subway station and walk up into the street, it was pitch black, midnight black, snowing soot all down through downtown Manhattan. This was about two blocks from the World Trade Center. You couldn't see a foot in front of your face at that time. We then worked our way back uptown. All of the firefighters and police officials and National Guard are now evacuating everyone out of lower, lower Manhattan. They're going east towards Brooklyn and north, which is where we are now, up on Canal Street. I should add as well, Peter, we had one of our reporters was, down, was downtown and had a, a sight line of the World Trade Center at around 9.48, which is around the time I believe the first tower collapsed, Gloria Rivera, and she saw two, then three, then four people jump out of the top floors of the World Trade Center. She was with a firefighter who said, they're not falling, they're jumping. Watch their arms waving, and they counted a dozen people jump off the top floors. Uh, do you want to continue, George? 
Well, I'm just right now, they, as I said, they are evacuating everyone else out. But just to give you another sense, Peter, the, all over lower Manhattan, the, the sidewalks, the streets are covered with about a quarter to half inch of dust, of soot, uh, as if it were Pompeii. Most people are pretty calm right now. They're evacuating slowly as the firefighters come in. Um, but, but it really was one of the most frightening, horrific scenes I've ever seen uh, in my life. Thanks, George, very much. Uh, come back any time with a report. I just, as you were concluding there, watching these guys go up that escalator, and if it's in the World Trade Center, we assume that we know that their cameraman got out, but we don't know about anybody else because, uh, you know, within an hour and something of the time these two attacks had occurred, these two buildings had completely disappeared, and you begin increasingly to see more dramatic footage. George, George Stephanopoulos made a reference to Pompeii on the... On the, near Naples on the west coast of Italy, which was, you know, buried by a volcano. Uh, and, and you get exactly that same sense of freezing stuff in soot and dirt, um, as might have occurred by a volcano. Uh, Jim Kalstrom, with whom we're long familiar, former official of the FBI in the New York office, uh, is on the air, very deeply involved in the flight TWA 800 in investigation. Um, Jim, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, what do you think? Peter? I'm listening, Jim. I yes. just say, what do you think? I mean, just start and I'll... Well, uh, my first thought is with the tremendous casualties and the, uh, the death toll is just uh, overwhelming. It's, uh, it's a day that 50 years from now our children, if we're still teaching history, will, <laughs> will be taught about when... Uh, we, w we went to war on American soil with terrorism. Uh, Jim, have you had a chance uh, to talk to your more active colleagues in the FBI at the moment about, about what they're doing at the moment, wh whether they're able to... I mean, it seems the hardest thing at the moment is to make an appraisal of all this. It just happened, and it's just, in some respects, it's happened, and it's happened, right? Uh, Peter, you're right. I mean, it happened. It's shocking, but in some ways it isn't shocking. I mean, we've had, you know, the uh, hatred of America played out uh, at the Trade Center in 93. You know, they tried to take the Trade Center down. We've had the hatred played out in the USS Cole, the bombings of our embassies in Africa, the bombings of the barracks in Saudi Arabia. So now it's being played out big time here in the United States. Jim, what, 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 is, the, what, is, the, what is the principal goal of the FBI at a moment like this, when, when all of the emergency services are brought to bear in all of these locations? What's the FBI actually doing at the moment? I think the first concern of the FBI right now, right this second, is, is there going to be something else happening in the next five minutes, 30 minutes, hour, 12 hours? Simultaneous with that, uh, who did it? Uh, where are they? What do we know? What's the intelligence base? Tell us. Why didn't we see this coming? Uh, where do we go from here? What kind of articulate, defined information can we give the National Command Authority so that we can bring the necessary, mm. massive retaliation necessary uh, without a lot of collateral damage? Mm. Well, Jim, it's, thank you very much for checking in with us, and, uh, and please do at any time if you have news. That photo, that, as Jim was talking, Jim Kallstrom, the uh, the former director of the FBI here and a major force in the investigation of TWA 800, uh, which blew up off the south coast of uh, Long Island. Um, and the principal uh, operator in the first uh, World Trade Center bombing. A key investigator. Right. Um, but it's interesting, uh, forgive me, no offense intended him, he doesn't have much to say either today because in some respects there isn't much to say except the, except the horror of it. But as we were looking at just a moment ago, listening to George Stephanopoulos talking to our reporters who saw the who witnessed the horrifying uh, jump of some people from the top of the trade towers it was you just saw a hint of the of the just ahead of this little piece of video here before you saw a hint of what people were enduring at the top of the trade uh, towers before they collapsed as a result of the intensity of the fire and we've seen it before in other places around the world fire starts in a place people Often, ironically, nothing would have made any difference today. Do the wrong thing, they get trapped in an open window by fire coming into their room, and finally, and finally, they're finally they just jump uh, simply because the, if they don't jump, they're probably going to be burned, burned alive. 
Um, but as we have heard from, it's interesting that Governor Pataki is so nervous, and I don't blame him for a second, wanting to stay away from the magnitude of the casualties here today. But as John McKenzie reported from, from the fire department downtown, we got 200 fire department officials, 200 firefighters missing. And I don't know whether or not this is a, a firefighter uh, who's been brought, but you see in every case um, people getting uh, oxygen uh, because what uh, it isn't collapse if it isn't collapse that kills in some cases like this it is the deadly smoke anybody who's been involved in a fire knows the deadly smoke which suffocates people um, in a circumstance like this but we are only getting touches and it doesn't even have the chaos associated with it in many cases <clears throat> we're just getting touches now of what has happened in these variety of places. The Pentagon are being kept, quite logically, I think, back at some distance. Um, and, and in downtown, what's happened is that camera crews were downtown. I fear, to be perfectly honest, for some of the camera crews who work uh, nothing braver than a cameraman either, who goes right in when something has happened and may indeed have been at some of those places. Um, and it certainly takes time for video uh, to get back from a location like this so that we get a, you know, widening appreciation of what has happened. Um, but as I said, it's very hard to try to get some grasp now on, on the number of casualties. So we can do, <clears throat> in some cases, not more than just tell you how this is in terms of the whole country. The North American Air Defense Command, NORAD, um, is on the highest state of alert. And you had just made references earlier in the morning how the United States and, and Canada have cooperated in trying to keep the airports locked down last there was another aircraft on the air, but John, talk to me about this for a second, and then we'll come to this business about fuel. Sure. Um, you know, the, the North American Air Defense Command was a great factor in our lives in the 1960s. In the Cold War, yes. Exactly, and during the Cold War, it's up along, it's along, uh, up along the, the Northwest Territories and some of the independent uh, areas of, of the North. Nobody thinks about it anymore, and here it is on a state of alert today. No, but you factor that in, and evincing so many images uh, that Americans are uncomfortable with the idea that there's a no-fly zone in New York City, in Manhattan, being patrolled by F-16s with instructions to shoot down any errant aircraft, that the same is true in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, that military people um, and doctors and military vehicles are coming to aid, mm -hmm. that the National Guard is on alert, you know, the kind of images that used to only exist in the fantasies of seven days in May, mm. where, you know, the army would take to the streets, um, which has not happened yet. They've offered assistance mm. and, and military logistical assistance. But that kind of thing that Americans are so uncomfortable with uh, unfolding here. Uh, and I realize, by the way, just as you mentioned it, <clears throat> something else is very important at the moment. And again, I don't mean to say this in melodramatic terms. Where is the president of the United States? Yeah, the president of the United States led, I know we don't know where he is, but pretty soon the country needs to know where he is. And it seems to, I think, for me anyway, I apologize, uh, President needs to talk to nice. He left Florida a couple of hours ago. Um, I mean, our people in Washington are clearly listening and, and checking this as, as best they can. But one of the important factors at the moment is that the political leadership in the country um, be present as Governor Pataki was. Governor uh, Mayor Giuliani of New York you know, made an appearance on the street and was caught on where is like everybody else, but Governor Pataki came out and, and basically told the citizenry of New York in a variety of different ways, I assume, just exactly what they're trying to do. Now, here's a, here's a bulletin about the president's whereabouts. The, Bush, the president is about to make a statement at Barksdale Air Force Base shortly. Barksdale Air Force Base is in Louisiana. So, if this is accurate, and we'll check with Claire Shipman and our other reporters at the White House and John Cochran, if he can, in, in Florida at the moment, who's with the president today. The president's not coming back to Washington at the moment. We'll leave that for just a second. We'll talk a little more about this business of the aircraft and the fuel. We're trying to figure out why, or why would a plane going from Newark to San Francisco, Boston, Los Angeles be involved in this? It could have been any plane, though, right? It could have been, but when you consider the advantage to a terrorist, here you have a transnational flight it's going to be a larger aircraft in each case. But, and this is the key, because we had speculated earlier, was there some additional explosives laden in these planes to, to cause these incredibly large explosions? It appears who's ever planned this has picked cross-country flights that would have the maximum amount of fuel you could carry on a domestic flight. Flights going from one end of the country to the other. 
the kind of jet that if you slammed into a building would ensure the maximum uh, fire and explosion possible from any flight that you could have chosen. Again, Newark to San Francisco, Boston to LA, Dulles to Los Angeles, uh, Washington to LA, Boston to LA. Um, the planes that are being looked at in this, uh, in this attack today mm -hmm. were apparently, or you could speculate, chosen for, to give the terrorists the very biggest bang uh, for their effort. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting point you make because, again, our assumptions tend to go when we see huge explosions like this. None of us understanding visually the power of explosives, that, that there were explosives on board. And so you're quite right. They may indeed have, it may indeed have been the aircraft explosion. I mean, John Nance could help us with this, but when you hear the, the amount of fuel, um, very flammable uh, aeronautical fuel that's loaded onto a plane for a 3,000-mile trip or something, um, that's going to give you quite an explosion. Uh, flight 800, which was an international flight, uh, okay. to those who saw it, was an incredible explosion. And John, if you'd sit, sit at your station for a second, I'm just going to go and try to check one piece of information. And in, the, in that period of time, we're going to try to give you a little better sense of, of, uh, of what's... Of the, of, the, of the disaster at the Trade Towers today. Here, here's something we've compiled, and we compile it as we go along. I was standing next to One World Trade Center and then all of a sudden I heard rumbling and we all started running away from it. The glass like blew out and threw me onto the sidewalk and I, I couldn't see for like 20 seconds. And then I started seeing vaguely the street and I, I just started walking and I started, my eyesight came back. I see you're, you're bloody, you have dust all over you. Yeah, it was bad. It was like a dust storm or something, like I couldn't see anything. How badly are you hurt? I have no idea. As soon as you got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. So we just come out of Tower One. We're walking towards Broadway. They're saying, move along, move along, move along. I looked up as soon as we got across the street. I looked up. I saw the building start, the tower start to buckle. I just turned and ran, ducked down, put a jacket over my head. Three or four of us huddled together, and uh, it was uh, just black everywhere. Were you covered? Were you hit with debris? No, 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 no. But I mean, I was stuck behind a subway cover, so put a, you know with the jacket over the three of us, you know, all of us huddled together. There was you know dust and whatnot everywhere, but it was. get down oh, come down people. can't even look at it because all I can see are people I don't see a building I see people people hurt children without mothers and fathers tonight <laughs> if you're just joining us you probably already know the World Trade Center towers the twin towers the New York landmarks have collapsed and are gone the Pentagon has been hit by a, a airplane a series of hijackings apparently today um, at the root of this. What we know is hundreds, if not thousands, are injured, uh, no count on the deceased yet, and that the investigation, a massive investigation, is just beginning to unfold. But John, I, the re I stepped aside there, among other things, the moment to try to get some sort of sense from people who talk to, because as soon as this happens, people begin to think about a response. We don't expect a response to come. In, in the immediate future by any means. But I was just talking to Charlie Gibson uh, from Good Morning America, and, and he'd been thinking about the same thing, that the response to this from the United States is going to have to be massive. They have to accomplish something in some way, because so much of the response to terrorism before by a large nation such as this, which is not impotent, but very limited in, in its capacity to operate at this kind of level. You were mentioning earlier the attacks against Osama bin Laden's training camps in Afghanistan. In retrospect, they spent, as you pointed out, more than a million dollars per cruise missile. I forgot how many they sent. Oh, they didn't get anything. They didn't get anything. They didn't do anything. So it's a very, it's an enormous challenge for, for a powerful nation to, uh, to, to respond in, a, in an effective way. And the Pentagon is still burning, and today the World Trade Center towers have gone. Uh, Diane Sawyer. Is, is down uh, in Times Square at the moment, and among other things, I think has been trying to get some grasp 
of the number of casualties involved. And it must be very difficult, Diane. It's impossible, Peter, no matter how many people you call. And of course, no matter what the facts we get now, one can only imagine what the facts will be later. I want to give you a sense of what it's like here in Times Square right now. Because if you look outside, we have hundreds upon Roger. hundreds upon hundreds of people standing outside, just stopping still, a kind of respectful witness looking up at the screens where we're broadcasting the pictures. They can't hear the sound. They are simply looking at the wordless horror and standing to show, in a way, respect. And I want to show you something else, because people have been sent home from Times Square and across the way, the construction workers who were building the Toys R Us building next door to us just hung their signs outside. God bless America and pray for families and victims. And we can only, of course, add to that that as crisply as we try to report what's happening here today, we join them. And this is not just another story, even for reporters who have been trained to do this for so long. A few things to add since this morning. We were on the air, of course, live when suddenly we get word of that first explosion at the World Trade Center, the first building. And initially, of course, we didn't know if it was an accident. We didn't know what had happened. And then we were on the air live when the second plane came in and the second plane hit. And I want to show you now. This is what we were seeing live on the air. And as you've expressed before, Peter, the combination of disbelief and horror and simple prayer for somebody to save the people who were inside that building is all anybody can do as an entire network is broadcasting live something so unimaginable. I have talked, as you all have and as George Stephanopoulos reported, to the people who were inside as these scenes were taking place. We now see the first collapse, which of course took place about 10 a.m. Eastern time. And then it would be about 28 minutes later that we would see the second collapse of the second building. And while we're watching the scene, each person desperate, desperate to stop this tape and go and do something. All we can do is relive the horror each time we see it. I have talked to people who are inside the building, one of them, Fran Martin, who is the aunt of someone who works here at ABC, and she was saying that the first experience inside the building was that earthquake-like feeling a number of people have mentioned. And then something else, in an eerie, silent, uh, kind of mournful foliage, you saw paper just wafting out in all directions. And it was so mysterious to everyone. They couldn't imagine what had happened. The paper was scattering. And we've now read some three miles out, way across the river, the paper from those floors. As they came down the stairs, we're told that people were remarkably calm, were remarkably respectful of each other as they were making their way down, even though a number of them had lived through that bombing eight years ago. A number of them remembered what it was when the bomb went off in the basement of the World Trade Center. And of course, as we now know, if the cyanide gas had not vaporized in those bombs, that it would have been a cataclysm even beyond what was experienced then. So they could all relive it as they were making their way down. Now we're watching the scenes as the building is collapsing and people are running from it People are covered with this kind of spectral suit from the building's collapse itself. I want to point out again, and you've talked about it too, Peter, all the firefighters were immediately called on duty. All the firefighters immediately raced in from wherever they were to help out, all the emergency medical service personnel. This was a great display of human concern and human consideration. And you've mentioned before, we have this report that 200 firefighters are now missing, and yet they have done everything they can. Every hospital is open, every hand is on deck, every doctor is standing by in the city of New York with um, all this courage and struggle and still heartbreak 
out there in the streets right now. So that's it from Times Square, Peter. Thank you very much, Diane. I remember uh, working uh, with Diane on the Millennium broadcast on New Year's Eve 2000. Diane had such a joyful time in, in Times Square. It is, uh, whatever you think of New York in general, it is a place where people from around the world gather to express themselves. And so we'll go back there on, on occasion to, to get some, you can really get some sense of the world in Times Square. And President Bush has been on the phone uh, today to a variety of world leaders, um, clearly discussing this with them at the highest possible level. And perhaps they're all as confused as the rest of us are as to um, what has happened, who perpetrated these acts of terrorism in the United States, and what is to be done in response. Though this is perhaps, we're only four hours since this actually happened, and perhaps it is not quite the time to begin to think about the precision of a response, but a response will be required of some magnitude that will mean something from the United States if one is able to ever able to pin down exactly who the perpetrators were. Uh, we told you that the president was in Florida this morning where he'd intended to talk about education today and was coming back to Washington. Um, he's made it as far as Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana where he landed um, about an hour and a bit ago um, just before noon Eastern time where he's made a statement to the cameras which we haven't got our hands on yet but the president uh, said that the president uh, said that freedom had been attacked but freedom will be defended and the president is in touch with his national security team and Compton ABC's Ann Compton who covers the White House for us for many years from us tells us that jet fighters that jet fighters accompanied Air Force One and that as best we can tell uh, the Air, Air Force One was flying at a particularly high altitude. There are no planes taking off or landing in, or taking off in the United States at the moment with the, with the exception of Air, One, Air Force One, though the Federal Aviation Administration says at the moment that 50 known aircraft, this is actually a few minutes old, 50 known aircraft are all in the sky uh, within approximately 50 miles of their destination. So you can feel across the country that aircraft that were in flight are beginning to settle down. They were ordered to settle down by the FAA and to land at the nearest possible airport. And so that has begun to work out. Now in, in Washington, I think Claire Shipman uh, at, the, at the White House or near it has some further information about the president. Yes, Claire. Well, that's right, Peter. What, essentially, what we've learned is what he told the pool cameras a few minutes ago, and we're hopefully going to see in just a few minutes, but he said that the he and this government have taken steps to ensure the functioning of the United States government, that the U.S. military is on high alert at home and abroad. He said he has taken all appropriate security measures to protect Americans. He says freedom itself has been attacked and freedom will be protected. And finally, he also said he will hunt down and punish those responsible for this. Again, we're hoping to see him in person, but as you mentioned, it looks as though this may be the secure place that they've decided on for, um, for the president, at least temporarily, Barksdale Air Force Base in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. I'd be really curious, Claire, and I realize how difficult it is at the moment, whether or not there's not pressure, political pressure in Washington from the members of the president's own staff and cabinet for him to, to, to show up soon. Uh, in front of the country and assure them beyond his statement that freedom has been attacked and freedom will be defended, of course, because it wasn't defended this morning. Well, I think whether or not the president will be seen in command in a more vigorous way. I think you're absolutely right, and I'm sure it's a delicate balance right now between the Secret Service and those who are trying to protect the president, keeping him out of sight and someplace secure, and, and his political advisors who would clearly like to see him make a statement. You saw how quickly he did it this morning, as brief as it was, and certainly a piece of tape that we're going to see in a, in a few minutes, we hope, um, is, not, is not what they would like to see the president uh, doing right now. They would like to see him making something of a more formal statement. But again, it could be a number of hours before the president is back in Washington and prepared to, to talk to us from that forum. Okay, thanks very much, Claire. We'll come back to you anytime you, anytime you want. And again, none of us should be surprised at what's happening. First of all, Secret Service is a huge, powerful, authoritative organization which takes the, the uh, president's safety and other members of the senior political leadership with deep and profound seriousness, but they have enormous power. And so if you're talking between a senior political official and the president's secret service official of equal stature at the moment, who's going to win that argument at the moment? And this is particularly true in a situation which continues to unfold because while the devastation, the, the, uh, the, perhaps the grand or the greatest devastation has occurred in New York City tomorrow morning, it's, this morning it's also occurred 
in outside Washington at the at the Pentagon, and and the the tension is there all across the country because not only were the United Nations and various government buildings evacuated here in New York City but the Sears Tower in Chicago, the tallest skyscrapers in Boston and Cleveland and Minneapolis and the Space Needle in Seattle. So the, uh, the psychological effect on people in the country is huge. It may indeed be settling down after several hours but the president and his response to this is also part of the psychological package because the country looks to the president on occasions like this to be reassuring to the nation. Some presidents do it well, and some presidents don't. But ABC's Ann Compton is with the president at the moment, and we have her on the telephone. Annie. Peter, it has been a frightening couple of hours for President Bush. We took off in Air Force One from Florida, where he first got word of this. And we literally, Peter, have been flying at well over 40,000 feet uh, west. The White House unable to tell us where we were headed or how long it would take. There were jet fighters off the wing just out of our sight until we landed. And the president has spent the time on board the aircraft talking not only to world leaders, but to the vice president, uh, to his cabinet. He even checked in with Mrs. Bush, uh, trying to get more information. We were high enough so that the Air Force was actually able to get some television signal. Uh, we don't know much about what's gone on on the ground, but he has been able to see some of it on a very fuzzy uh, television picture. We landed here at Barksdale Air Force Base. This is near Shreveport, Louisiana at about 11.45 Eastern Time. We were not allowed to use cell phones or give you any indication of where we were until local people noticed the plane on the ground. The president has just made a statement, Peter, a very emotional one, saying that freedom has been attacked, but freedom will be defended, saying that America's military is on its highest state of alert. World leaders have been uh, assured that the U.S. will do whatever it takes to protect America and Americans. Frankly, Peter, I thought the president not only looked grim, very solemn, but his eyes looked somewhat red. Annie, let me ask you a couple of questions, if I, if I may. First of all, the president was on a, on a education trip, ostensibly, in Florida today. How much of the national security team was with him? Uh, this is actually a skeleton team with him on a short, uh, it was a trip that lasted only about 24 hours. He was just making his last appearance before returning to Washington. And Carl Rove, one of his senior counselors, is with him. Uh, and his press secretary, Ari Fleischer. But none of the national security apparatus, such as Condoleezza Rice, who would ordinarily travel with the president on a more substantive trip. But on Air Force One, of course, he has the full resources of communications. Uh, but he does not have the full team with him. Well, let's talk about this for a second, because when the president took off from Florida and went immediately to 40,000 feet, and I believe actually got a fighter escort for part of the way, it reminds one a little bit of what it was like in the Cold War, because the Cold War, there was always a provision that the senior members of the government, president included, could in fact run the country from a command center in the sky. Is Ab that basically what's happening this morning? Absolutely. In fact, the U.S. used to have five aircraft, now Air Force One. Let me know if we're being taken out of here. Uh, we may be scrambled out of here. Okay. Are we leaving? Okay. Peter, the, we are leaving. And Where I are you going, Annie? Peter, I have no idea. They have not told us. They have kept us. Uh, uh, we don't even know whether we'll be able to see the president or travel with him, but we are told that he's been traveling. He will continue. They are still quite worried about his own security. Off you go, and Anne, thanks very much for Thank a you. very, very full report on on the state of, and, and perhaps even a little bit of the, of the uh, mental condition of the president at, at the moment, and we cannot state it often enough. Uh, the country looks to him, and so he may have stopped at Barksdale Air Force Base in, in, in Louisiana, which is just where Arkansas and Texas and Louisiana all, all come together uh, at an Air Force Base uh, out of the way, and he may be safe at 40,000 feet in, in, in Air Force One, but before long, uh, the country is going to expect him to be back in Washington to send, if not only a message, not just a message to those of us in the nation, who look to the president for some sense of political national stability, but also to the other parts of the world where these enemies of the United States, with whom we've, whom we've talked quite a lot about today, at the moment must surely think they have the United States on the run to some extent. And while the Taliban, the political leadership, 
political, military, religious leadership in, in Afghanistan said this morning that, that they condemned this and had nothing to do with it. And it could not have been Osama bin Laden because he wasn't sophisticated enough to do it. It had to be a country or a government, certainly. And while the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat, came out and put as much distance as they could between th them and, and the Palestinian people, this active in the Palestinian people, the president needs to be on station to talk it. As does the mayor of New York, and Mayor Giuliani is with us at the moment. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? I can't, Peter. Mr. Mayor, I saw you several times on the street today, and it, it looked like you were deeply sharing the horror that all of us feel. But I'd really appreciate, aside from on top of your sentiments about all this, give us some sense of what's going on. What, what is going on now is a massive uh, rescue effort. We have thousands of police officers and firefighters in all of Manhattan trying to rescue as many people as we possibly can. Uh, there are still a lot of people there that are injured, hurt, dazed, and we're trying to get them out. And we're, 